Psalm 122. Uh, it's in my heart. I was, I had a message, a different message for this morning. And, um, I, it was going to be, it's going to be pretty rough. But God changed my heart. And, um, and this is sort of the direction that I'm going to go in, uh, today. I know I'm not going to get done today. So this will be sort of a series, I guess, that we're going to preach on families. And it, the title of it, it would be The Strength of Family. The Strength of Family. And when I think about um, everything that I've dealt with, everything that has been laid on me, both good and bad, God was wise. When he wrote in the scriptures, and he put it in there twice, the qualifications for a bishop, a pastor, he's be the husband of one wife. And I knew a man, used to be friends with him years ago, he was pastor of a little Baptist church. We'd go out for lunch every now and then, and he was unmarried at the time. And I had just had, I think, our first two children, Lindsay and Alicia. And I told him, I said, I'm going to tell you something. You might have, you might enjoy the freedom now of not having a family while you minister, but I'm telling you, you won't learn God the way that you will when you have a family. When you, when you start having children, you'll understand God and how He works a lot better. And finally, he did get married, and um, I, don't, I don't think I was around him when he had his children, but I hope he learned that lesson in the ministry, because I don't think I would be here without my wife. I don't think I'd make it. She has been strength for me when I did not have strength in me. She has been perseverance for me when I did not was not going to persevere. And like I said, God is very wise. He understands us. He made us. He created us. And He created us to be compacted together like or in a family. That's the way He's designed us. And I'm going to share that with you from Scriptures. Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So as I'm preaching this, it's going to be twofold. First of all, you have your birth family, a mom and dad, children, or a husband and wife, children, brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws, things like that. Some people are this way, some are not. Some families, they hate each other. They fight and pick and they can't stand one another and they just, they don't do well. Some people, however, our dad and mom really instilled in us what family was supposed to be. Mom and dad had their problems. You know, sis and I, we didn't know everything. We didn't, we didn't understand everything, but there were things that we heard. And so we knew that mom and dad had problems. But by the grace of God, they, God worked it out in them. And they understood that there was nothing really more important to them than family. Now, and, and there's several ways that as I go through this, there's several ways I'm going to preach it. In some cases, your earthly family will end up being your fiercest enemies. In that case, God has provided for you a gift of a different, better family to be part of. Amen? So don't, don't misunderstand me to say that your earthly family is above everything because it's not. But your heavenly family is. Nothing, nothing is more important than that. Now, I'll show it to you from scriptures. 
I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. So think of Jerusalem as a church or a family. Churches are families. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. We're not all sitting out in a, you know, separated from each other by miles and miles. God has brought us into this place. Even those of you online, you are with us, compacted together with us. And he said in verse 4, Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. This is why we're here on the first day of the week, to give thanks unto God for what He's done for each and every one of us. And when somebody in this church stands up and gives a testimony about how good God's been to them, if you've been down in the dumps all week, tell God thank you that He was good to somebody. He'll be good to you too. Just wait your turn, amen. He'll get, you'll get there. Verse 5, For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is your family. Jerusalem is your church. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray. Moms and dads, pray that there's peace in your family. Pray that there's peace in your family. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, listen to this now, I will now say, peace be within thee. Look at where David's heart is. For my brethren and my companions' sakes. I want peace. For my wife's sake. For my children. Lisa and I had our problems. We didn't share everything with our children, but I'm sure they heard things. And God dealt with me. Mike, there's something in this world that's way more important than you are. And it was... Family. Family for the sake of family. For my brethren and my companions' sake. I will now say, peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Underline that in your Bible. Because of the house of the Lord, I will seek thy good. God has planted it in my heart as a young man growing up. God knew that I, He could not use me to pastor or preach. Until I had learned family. Until I learned what sacrifice it takes as the man, as the husband, to make sure the family's fed, to make sure the bills are paid, to make sure their teeth are straight, to make sure that the family does well before me. Did I want things? Yeah, I wanted a boat. I don't think God would ever give me a boat. I think I'd sink it and die in a blaze of glory. As clumsy as I am. I'd crash it. Ain't no doubt. But I wanted things. But I knew better than to just grab the money because that money was needed to pay bills take care of the family and it was for their sake that I had to learn those sacrifices as a man before God could allow me before God could use me in his church his church and I want you to think of it like this the the family that God gave me was the training for the church not the other way around and then for me then Because of the house of the Lord, I will seek thy good. It has been in my heart since November 1996 
when I first stepped into that office, I was, I was bawling my eyes out, crying unto God. God was dealing with me. God was chastening me. I mean, hard. And I begged God for the good of this place. And it's been in my heart ever since. And I want you to consider that. That that's your life. That you chose this. Or maybe God chose you for this. But this is who we are. This is who we have. And for better or for worse, this is our family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings now upon the message. Lord, I need to hear it. I need to hear from heaven today. I'll be the first one for you to preach to. I'm not the preacher. Jesus Christ is. The Holy Ghost is the preacher. So, Father, send down from heaven what you would have for us to hear today. Help us to understand, God, that there's something in this world that is way more important than us. And that it really isn't about us. It's about what you've instituted in this world before you put anything else here. You built and raised a family. And Father, help us, dear God. Our enemy has attacked our families violently, viciously, horrendously destroyed families. Destroying it all over this country and in this church. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would set our minds and our hearts all on the same vision. That we, what we do, we do for the sake and for the good of the house of the Lord. So, Father, teach us some things, remind us of some things. And, Father, if we're guilty of sinning against the family of God, the house of God, forgive us of that sin and correct us and chastise us, Father. Make us more in your image and in the image of your church, which is the image of Jesus Christ. Father, just bless us today and help us. Help me to preach this. Help me to preach this to my family first. And then to the family of God this morning. Help us to hear from heaven, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn to Psalm 2, since you're in Psalm. Turn to Psalm 2. By the way, who's, who's our conspiracy people? Jeffrey Epstein. Was that, here's the man that has the list of the most famous and most powerful and most wealthy men in the world who he has flown to his pedophile island, releasing the list, and now he's hanging dead. I don't buy it for a second. Nobody else does either. But I'm just telling, and what's reminded me of this is Psalm, what's in Psalm 2. There is a conspiracy against families. Do you believe that? You should, because you've, you've had to endure it. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, look at verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. God showed me this years ago. I've mentioned this so many times, but it just fits right in with this. The, the role of the man in the home is that, and we use this word husband, which means house band. Literally, it's what it means. House band. It is, and get off your high horse over this, it is the man. 
that God set to be the one who binds the family together. And if you don't believe that, consider what has happened to manhood in this country. Destroying God's principles inside of homes by targeting the men. And ladies, it does not work when two ladies are trying to pretend that they're men in the family. I don't care what you, I don't care what, I, listen, this is God's way. This is what God says. It is not my hatred for anybody in the world. It is my love for God's way that causes me to say that. God establishes a band of families to stay together. And there is a working of principalities to destroy families by targeting the husbands. Smite the shepherd. And what happens to the sheep? Bad things. That's a joke, by the way. Bad things. So, he says here, let us break their bands. This is a wedding band. And it was a symbol of an oath that I swore to my wife. And it means something to me. After 32 years, I, I figured it out. It means something to me. It means that I have a responsibility. Because I promised her that it was for better or for worse. And I couldn't get any worse and I need to be a lot better. So it's for better or for worse. It wasn't just in the sunshine, it was in the rain. That I was to love her and to cherish her and to honor her and protect her. And then to provide for the benefit of her and the children of the family to provide for their benefit even at the sacrifice of my own. How many stories have we heard in days gone by of mothers and dads doing without food for days so their children could eat? We don't have, we don't think that way anymore. The devil has destroyed these ideas and these philosophies out. I remember years ago we used to have a daycare here and the state required that we go get some training and what it was, it was social engineering. I figured it out. So we drove all the way to Mizzou, to Columbia, uh, Missouri, to, to Missouri University, so this liberal could tell us what a family now is. A family is a group of people who love each other. And what he was meant by that, he was destroying the Judeo-Christian principle of a family being a man and a wife and their children now, and it was opening the doors for just anybody and anything in any way to be a family. And that's not, was not God's idea. Now, I'm, I got, I'm got to give you the justice with the grace. Because I'm going to give you both. And, and all of this that I'm going to preach, I'm going to give you the justice of God. But then I'm going to show you the grace of God. Because you're sitting in a room, and those of you who are joining with us, you know this. Our families have been battered, torn, beat up, houses divided in this church. And none of it is pretty. There's no glory in it. There's no good thing that comes out of it. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Let's relearn God. Let's relearn God. Let's relearn God's ways. Genesis 1, He creates the world. Genesis 2, He creates the family. And there's not a king on the earth until eight chapters later in Genesis 10 when Nimrod became a king. There wasn't a king anywhere. What there was, you listen to this now, what there was, there was families. Adam had his family. And his son Seth did what God, what Adam said to Eve. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife. So Seth found him a wife. Don't, don't get into where does Seth get his wife. Who cares? Seth found him a wife and they left. And that, that was Seth's family. Adam had his family. Seth had his family. 
Enos had his family, and then on down the lineage. And then you get that, we'll get to know it here in a little bit. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. He said it was not good that the man... Man, it's not good that you're alone. Amen? It's not... Listen, your wife is good for you. Even if she's the opposite of everything you are, that's good. Somebody needs to counteract you. Somebody, somebody needs to put their foot down or up. And that's what a good wife will do. Ladies... Listen to me. You will never, ever hear me say, ladies, you're to say yes, sir, no, sir, to the husband. You're to be strictly obedient to him. Whatever he says goes. You'll never hear me say that. Now, I believe in the husband as the authority. But if you read the Bible, which you should, in every place there was authority, there was someone counseling. The king almost never made decisions alone in the days of Pharaoh Pharaoh was in charge of everything but he had a dream and he needed counsel on it and Joseph came and counseled him on that dream and then God put Joseph in charge even though Pharaoh was king Joseph was the one in charge you see what I'm saying and in every situation in the Bible you show me somebody in charge I'll show you somebody counseling that person whether it's good counsel or bad counsel, somebody's helping that person out. Same way in a church. Same way in a family. So he said in verse 21, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, brought her into the man. Now the lesson in that is, the woman is not some alien creature from outer space that is totally against everything that the man is. God took her out of him. She was part of him. Bone of his bone. Flesh of his flesh. Made for him. And the Lord, you look at, um, look at verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. It's just like when the dad brings the girl Sterling brought his daughter down, gave it to me. What in the world were you thinking, Sterling? Brought her down and gave her to me. That was a big responsibility. That man was given his most precious thing was his daughter. Those two share a relationship that is just amazing. And that man was giving his most valuable thing to a guy like me. And it took me a long time to wake up to that. To grow up to that. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. That's the child that they bring forth. Now we have a family. And they were both naked. The man and his wife. And were not ashamed. God has designed it so that the man and the woman together. That's not sin. Amen? Anything but that is sin. But that's not sin. That's holy in God's sight. And that, thus God created the foundation of every civilization to rise and fall in the world. You look at history. Be a student of history. As the family goes, so goes the culture and the civilization. When the family unit is destroyed. You take, look at, look at places like Japan. Japan is a idol worshipping, pagan society. But family is number one always been that way and their civilization has survived for thousands of years because of family unit now you ponder that for a while here in the western world now it's become anything goes and it's destroyed the families thus it will destroy this this nation will fall and crumble because of the destruction of the family 
Before God put anything else in the world, He ordained a husband and a wife and they brought children into this world and God said, it's good now. And God blessed them. In fact, God blessed them twice. He blessed them before the flood, said, be fruitful, multiply, and they did. And then after the flood, Noah and his what? His family come off the ark and God blesses them and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's exactly what they did. Turn to Ephesians 5. We're relearning God. That's what we're doing. You say, well, I've preached on this before. I won't preach on it again. There are things, and listen to me, I, and I've asked my family, my family, to listen to this message. My sons are up in Iowa. I've told Matthew last night, Matthew, you go to your church, but afterward I want you to listen to this message. If I don't preach this to my family first, I'll be in dereliction of my duty as pastor. If I think that my family can do no wrong, I'm wrong. So it would not be right for me to bypass my own and preach down to you and leave mine out of it. It would be wrong for me to do that. So my girls are here. And you better listen to your daddy. Because I signed your paycheck. No, they're going to listen to their daddy. They love their daddy. That was an amen, wasn't it? All right. Husbands. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. If that is not present, there will be no, there will be no family. When women talk about how hard it is for them to give reverence to their husband, I say to that, the, re, the, the greater responsibility is in the man, not the woman. It is his job. It is his responsibility. It must be in his heart to love his wife. Or there'll be no family. There'll be no godly family. I was taught years ago that as a pastor, I should treat the church as my wife. I have two wives. I just don't tell each other about the other. But if I don't love this church as much or more than I love myself, I'm not fit to be here. I'm not just the dictator or the figurehead telling everybody what to do while I go slop around through life. I must love my church or I'm not fit to be here. Years ago, we interviewed a man to be pastor here. And when I interviewed, when I talked to him, I asked him, I said, why are you interested in our church? He said, well, my mother's in, a, he said, I'm up north in Iowa. And he said, my mother's in a nursing home down around Bonterre somewhere, something like that. And he said, I'm looking to just move down so I can be close to her. And, and I did not say this to him, but I thought, you're not God's man. If you don't come down here to love this church, you cannot be the pastor here. And that, that, was, that was the end of the conversation. That, that's as far as it went. And I begged God, 1996, to let me be a blessing to this church. I cannot say that I've always done that. So I have to be honest. I have to be truthful. I have to be repentant. That I've failed in that God help my failures because I want to be a good pastor husbands you're to love your wives you're to love your wife unconditionally you're to love her when she's not lovable you're to love her when she is pretty or not pretty you're to love her when she's mean or nice you're to love her 
and, and give her, hey, the Holy Ghost gives the church gifts, does it not? Does the church earn the gifts? No, God gives it. Husbands love your wives. Give, 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 give. Husbands, give to your wives. Give of yourself. Give, and I preach this in a, in a wedding ceremony. The gift without the giver is bare. You can buy your wife things, but if you're not there for her, you're not, you're not what she needs. You're not being what she needs. I learned this. My wife taught me this. That I'm to be there for her. To listen to her. To hear her speak. So she can tell me things that's on her mind and on her heart. God dealt with me about that. Husbands, you're to love your wives. If you lay your hand on your wife, they ought to take you out somewhere and pound on you. Until you learn a lesson that that's never appropriate. I want to hear somebody say amen. amen. Don't you ever lay your hand on your wife. Ever. Even as Christ also loved the church. Does, does Jesus beat his wife? No, he loves her. He puts up with our... What Jesus does is put up with us. That's what he does. He cares about us. He listens to us when we cry and scream and throw our fits and... Do things that are wrong. He still loves us. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us in the good times and in the bad times. He loves us. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. By the word, men, you are to be, number one, a man of your word. And you are to be a man of the word. That means you got to read your Bible and believe it. And God will start chiseling things off of you like an artist would, a sculptor. Or God, as the potter to the clay, will start making out of you what He wants out of you and not what you want for yourself. You hear me? Yield. Husbands, Men are to yield themselves to God and to His Holy Spirit. And let Jesus teach you how to be a man. Amen. That He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Listen to me now. Churches are to be holy. Separated. From the world. Not looking. I mean who wants a wife. That's always looking at other men. Who wants a wife. That's got an app on her phone. Where she's hooking up with men. Strange men everywhere. Who wants a wife like that. Jesus doesn't. His bride. Is to be holy. And separate. And washed. Clean. By his word. So men ought to be men of their word and men of the word of God. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You feed yourself, do you not? Bathe yourself, clothe yourself. Take care of yourself. That's how you're to treat your wife and your family. Feed them. Not just physical food, but that's part of it. But spiritual nourishment. Husbands and fathers, teach your children. Take time to spend with your children, teaching them things, showing them things. My dad worked in vain to teach me how to split wood. And I broke every axe. And every split and maul that he had, he even had one made up. It's a split and maul with an iron pipe coming out of it. That he had a guy where he worked weld it together so it never break. And I broke it. But he had to teach me those things. He had to teach me how to hunt. Teach me how to fish. It was my dad that taught me how to kill that buck. Is my dad taught me how to change tires and change the oil and 
It's my dad who taught me those things. And before I went to Bible college, my mom had to teach me how to do my own dirty laundry. Well, that was harder than splitting wood, let me tell you. But see, that's what families do. They prepare one another for days to come. That's what a church family ought to do with one another. Um, verse 29, I'm going to say something here in a minute I'm not wanting to say. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. You come to this church, God will make you as this church. It's not easy. Because sometimes we're hard to get along with. Just like in a marriage. Sometimes we're not easy to get along with. And here's what I've learned in all the years of pastoring and, and trying to bring people together. Is that each one, each one. One must yield and bend to the other. Is that not true in your marriage? That each one must yield and bend and conform to the other like pieces of a puzzle. And that's not easy to do sometimes. It takes time. It takes love. It takes patience and it takes sacrifice. And then, here's the kicker. Then, ladies, you find out something about your husband you, you didn't know. And you don't like it. Do you throw him out? You don't have to. You can love him and pray that God delivers him. Did you know in Second Peter, I believe, there is a way, believe it or not, that a man can be saved without the Bible. Did you know that? Where is that? Second, Second Peter? Chapter 2. I got this old rickety Bible here. I like it. I think I'll use it. Chapter. Let's see. Where is it? First Peter? It's somewhere. Yeah, First Peter chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in submission, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Who saved King Ahasuerus from making the biggest mistake of his life? His wife, Esther. His wife did. King Ahasuerus was going to kill every Jew and thus bring down the wrath of God upon him and his entire kingdom. And Esther, his wife, saved him from that. Who saved David from killing in cold blood Nabal? Abigail saved David from making the biggest mistake of his life. So has my wife. So then you find out, a husband, same way. You find out something about her that you didn't know. And you didn't like it. This is where most marriages will crash and burn right then and there. Especially, listen to me now, in the days of social media, where a woman or a man can vent online and he'll find everybody who is in agreement with him, telling him, you don't have to put up with that. And that marriage is gone. I'm telling the truth. And it's the same way in a church. 
So what if you find out something you don't like about somebody in the church? What are we supposed to do? Pray, go to them, love them enough to restore them, to bring them to righteousness and truth. And I'm going to say something to you. There are people who have left this church and they're, they're calling people on the phone and they're trying everything in the world to destroy this church instead of love this church. I love this church. And what I find out about you, I never use against you, ever. It makes me love you more, not less. And I'm saying this to my own family first. And I'm saying this about you. There is a way to deal with unrighteousness in a family and in a congregation. And let me tell you something. You listen to your pastor. What if... Oh, let's... I want to make something up unusual. What if John started smoking marijuana? That's laughable, right? So I'm not going to tell you anything that I think he would do. I'm going to make something up that I know he wouldn't do. And I found out about it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to John. John, let's give that stuff up. You don't need it. That's rotten. That's from hell. That's Satan. Get out of it. He's already done it, right? He's already done it. What would happen if somebody else in the church found out about it? Let me tell you what's supposed to happen. Do you know why? Because the Bible lays out a plan that if a man is caught in a transgression, somebody goes to him it's, and it's forgiven... Did you know that it's not any of your business after that? You tell me if I'm wrong. You stand up and you tell me in this place if I'm wrong. I thought my sister was going to come at me there for a second. <laughs> you know what I'm going to tell you? I didn't all the way make that story up. It's happened, and it's been dealt with, and it's not anybody else's business. And you tell me if I'm wrong. It's been repented of and forsaken. And it's not for someone to get on the phone and start calling people and say, because and, I'm telling you, people have walked out of this church angry, people that I've known for years who will not speak to me ever again. Not for something I've done, but because of things that have happened here and it's over with and it's forgiven. But they put their place, they put it in their business to find out about it. And now they don't want to deal, they don't want this church anymore. I do. I'll take every sinner in Jefferson County. And I'll put up with you if you'll put up with me. And we'll love each other until we get to glory. That's the way it's supposed to be. And not any other way. Family doesn't turn their back on family. Thank you, Roy. You want me to tell you some other stories about things I know? No. I'm not going to do it. 
because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is why we're here. This is a hospital for sick people, sick and dying. I mean, there's people online I know stuff about. They've told me, they've admitted, I had people call me and say, Pastor, you don't know me, so I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about me. And, I, and he told me, and I said, you know what, I love you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. Thank you for being honest, because this is the place for honesty. Amen? For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined into his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but look at what he's talking about. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his life, wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Our husband is Jesus Christ. And ladies, you will show your reverence for Jesus by your reverence for your husband. You tell me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I want to keep preaching, but I've got to stop. There's a lot more here. I got to look at, look at Genesis 12. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Who's God blessing in Christ? Families. Families. I want my family blessed. Girls. I want my daughters blessed. I want you to be polished cornerstones in the house of God. You got to understand, those, those poor girls that had to live in my house with everybody watching them, waiting for them to do something wrong. I would not, I would not want to be in their place. But I love them. And I care deeply for them. And I am never turning my back on my family. And I feel that exact same way about every one of you. So you ought to also love one another. Amen? Tertia and Debbie, I'm going to hold you under. I hope that water turned warm. I'm going to ask them to step out. And uh, Melissa Kay, would you come? Let's come up here. Alicia, come. I want to get ready. And I want to, I want to close in prayer. I'm going to close in prayer. Now, I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you what some people have done. Tammy Dotson called me and she said, Pastor, somebody, I won't tell you who, somebody's calling me saying bad things about you and Bethel Church. And I told them, shut up. That's my church and that's my pastor and I'm not going to listen to it. <laughs> Olivia and Carmen live all the way out in Las Vegas. Somebody called them. Let me tell you about Bethel Church. They're not who you think they are. Now, I've never presented this place as being anything, anything other than a house of broken toys. And she told him, I don't want to hear it. That's my church and that's my pastor. And whatever you think you know, it stops right there. Can I hear God's people say amen? Okay? I love you.